When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that is very much the Danny Elfman of the True Crime Garage. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the captain. Well, I prefer Hans Zimmerman because he's a little dodgy. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week from the Garage Fridge, we have Kiwi Peach Sour Lina. From the good people at Firehouse Brewery and one of my absolute favorite cities, Charleston, South Carolina. Everyone should go to Charleston. Shout out to the Lee Brothers, Matt and Ted. Kiwi Peach Sour Lina, garage grade, three and a half bottle caps out of five. Kiwi Peach Sour Lina is, you guessed it, a sour ale. Now, I do not like sours. But plenty of people do, so I thought at some point we should feature one on the show, and this is a good one. Now, it's not I, all about you, man. It's well, not all about you. I did have to rely on friends to come up with the garage grade this week, so three and a half bottle caps out of five. And Kiwi Peach Sour Lina was brought to us by our good friends. First up, we have Trey and Anna, newlyweds in Atlanta. And from down under, we have a big cheers to Ozzy Matt. Cheers, mate. Next up, we have a long-distance cheers to Emma in Melbourne, Australia. And a big cheers to Emma in Sydney as well. And last but not least, a big shout-out to Karen Ann in McLean, Virginia. And thanks, everybody, for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And for all of our old episodes, check out the Stitcher app. If you download the Stitcher app, from episode one to now, they're all free on the Stitcher app. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Spring break week. Who does not love spring break? It's a beloved rite of passage for teens and college-age guys and girls. A week to blow off some steam and have a little fun, away from the pressures of parents and school. Maybe take an adventure to a beach or a party town for drinking, loud music, and dancing. One big party. A great place to go for spring break is Myrtle Beach, of course. Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. This is one of the most popular spring break destinations because of its beautiful beaches, great weather, great bars, and clubs. Millions of tourists and vacationers go to Myrtle Beach each year. The population is only about 30,000 people, 
So the influx during the peak parts of the year, especially spring break, is vast. Most 17-year-olds would jump at the chance to spend spring break in Myrtle Beach with friends. And that is apparently just what Brittany Drexel did. She took off with a group of girls to the South Carolina party town, 850 miles from home. And within three days, she became an endangered missing person. Let's talk about Brittany Drexel. Brittany was a star soccer player at her high school in Rochester, New York, where she was a junior. She was five foot tall and about 100 pounds. So she is a small girl, but one of her best friends, Casey, said that she was a force to be reckoned with on the soccer field. Brittany also had modeling ambitions and was also studying cosmetology. She loved to experiment with hair, makeup, and clothes, and she was very particular about her appearance. Now, looking into this case, we've both seen pictures of her with different hairstyles and different colors. One thing about Brittany was that she was blind in her right eye. This is due to PHPV, and she wore contacts that made both eyes, well, for lack of better explanation by myself, look the same, you know, Mm -hmm. kept one eye from wandering. When spring break started in April of 2009, Brittany was a junior at Gates Chile High School in Rochester. Brittany was at a sort of a difficult place in her personal life. For one thing, her mother, Dawn, was in the midst of, a, of getting a divorce from her stepfather, Chad. Brittany was very close with her stepfather, and he had been married to Brittany's mom for quite a while. Her mother's house, where Brittany lived with her younger siblings, this is Marissa and Camden, well, the house was under foreclosure, and the family was going to have to move. Brittany's relationship with her longtime boyfriend, John Greco, was also in turmoil and was on again, off again. Mm -hmm. Brittany had recently been diagnosed with depression and started taking antidepressants. Also around this time, we're talking 2008, 2009, There is some indication that Brittany had recently exhibited some unstable behavior. Chad Drexel, the stepfather, said that she had been sleeping late and skipping school. And Investigation Discovery, well, they reported that she had actually overdosed on painkillers. Although there are no reports that she was suicidal and her family and friends flat out deny that she would run away or want to hurt herself. So we later learn that Brittany planned to go on spring break with her friends and she desperately wanted to go. However, Captain, well, there was a big problem with Brittany's plan, right? Yes. She wasn't, she didn't have permission from her parents to go. That's right. Brittany had been bugging her mother for weeks about the spring break trip uh, because, but her mom, Dawn, refused to let her go. Apparently spring break in Myrtle Beach Uh, was some sort of senior class tradition at her high school. Mm -hmm. And on this particular year's spring break, April of 2009, there were a bunch of kids from Rochester going. So Brittany, as we said, was just a junior. You know, this is a senior tradition. Her mother did not know this group of older girls that Brittany wanted to travel with. But a lot of times when you're a junior, you have a lot of senior friends, so you want to experience some of the... Yeah, the senioritis with them. Well, her mother, Dawn, was not comfortable with her 17-year-old daughter being so far from home, unsupervised, hanging out, Mm -hmm. partying. Like most parents would, Dawn said no. The two fought about this. It was a shouting match, but Dawn stood her ground. Chad Drexel backed up his wife. Mm -hmm. Brittany was upset about this, and she would ask John to drive her to a friend's house. So on Wednesday night... This is April 22nd. Brittany took off with her friends to South Carolina anyway. This, of course, without telling her parents. In fact, she and her friends came up with a ruse to throw her mother off. Brittany called home and asked her mom if instead she could spend a few days at a friend's house nearby in Rochester. One of Brittany's friends got on the phone with Dawn, and Dawn thought that she was talking to a parent. Hmm. After being reassured that Brittany was going to stay local and to stay with local friends, 
uh, and parents would be present. Dawn told Brittany, yes, you can stay at your friend's house for a few days. But of course, we now know this was not a parent and Brittany wasn't staying local. She actually hopped in a car with some girlfriends and went to Myrtle Beach. And that's Wednesday, you said. Correct. While in Myrtle Beach, Brittany kept up the ruse with her mom, texting daily and even spoke on the phone with her at least once that we know of. Mm -hmm. And Brittany never let on that she was actually in South Carolina, hundreds of miles from home. Instead, she told her mom that she and her friends were watching movies and hanging out. Someone else uh, Brittany was in constant contact with was her boyfriend, John Greco. Mm -hmm. So John was aware that Brittany was going on this trip and that she had told um, him that she needed to get away. Right. She needed a break from the regular uh, everyday life. Remember, we said her parents are splitting up and might be losing the home. So a lot of stress is at home. Right. And you're going into your senior year. So it almost seems like it would make a little more sense in her life. And maybe she wouldn't struggle with it so much once she graduated high school. But the fact that it's going into her senior year, her, you know, we're going to have to move. My parents aren't together anymore. That's a lot to you know, take on going into your senior year. Mm -hmm. And I want to be clear here because we're going to, you know, we're going to have some people say, well, you're talking about her mother and her stepfather splitting up. But I want to point out the obvious here is that her stepfather's name is Chad Drexel. Brittany's name is Brittany Drexel. She was very right. right, But I'm point, what I'm pointing out is that this is not a, this is more of a father daughter relationship than a stepfather relationship daughter relationship with that just to be clear on this good for him for stepping up well and i want to point that out because there's there there would be more heartache for young britney in this matter than a typical you know my mom's getting a door divorce from my stepfather situation Mm -hmm. so john her boyfriend is aware that britney's going on this trip uh as we said but and he's not concerned about her going He just thought this was a short trip and she was actually checking in with him regularly. He says that she asked him to go along with her to South Carolina, but he could not because he had to work Mm -hmm. later. John says that he did not know um, because Brittany never told him about all of the people she was hanging out with down in Myrtle beach. And (laughs) of course not. Well, and later he adds, you know, and I think this shows a bit of his honesty Um, he's, he's, he adds saying, look, I would not have been happy if I would have known who she was hanging out with and how much she was hanging out with these other people. And I, we can assume that she, he's talking about guys, right? Right. Um, you know, he says, had I known this, I would have been pretty upset with her. Brittany and her friends arrived in Myrtle beach on Thursday, April 23rd. We know the names of some of the people that Brittany was with. Uh, all of these people were over 18 years old. The girls she traveled to Myrtle Beach with and stayed with were Alana Lippa and Jennifer Oberer. The girls also either traveled with or met up with a group of guys from Rochester. This is including Phil Oberer. Okay, so he is Jennifer's brother, Mm -hmm. but also Alana's boyfriend. And then we have this other guy, and his name's very tough for me to say. (laughs) It's, It's Ugger... Ozturk. That can't be. I think I got pretty close on the Mm -hmm. Ozturk's right. Um, This is Jennifer's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. There are some other guys there as well. All of these people were older than Brittany. The girls stayed at the Bar Harbor Hotel on North Ocean Boulevard. This is right off of the main drag. The night the girl, that night, that Thursday night, the girls decided to hit a club. This is called Club Kryptonite. And it is downtown Myrtle Beach. Now, we don't know how Brittany would get into this club, right? Um, Even if it was one of those clubs that would let in 18 and up, she's not 18. But we do know that she was there. And while there, she was seen with a guy from Rochester that she knew. Apparently, she knew this guy. And his name is, this is Peter Brazowitz. Now, Peter was with four <laughs> friends of his. This sounds like an evil character in a, in a book. Yeah. Uh, and the four friends of his, this is Keith Cummings, Phil Watson, Matt a- Abrams, and Anthony Schmizzy. 
I like Schmiz. Here, oh. I've thought. I, oh, Schmizzy. I shouldn't say this, but when I was doing the uh, Schmizzy for hizzy, you know, because I know we're diving right into this case, and people are like, "Oh, here, here, Nick goes with one of his dumb dinosaur brain comments." Mm-hmm. Uh, Duh. When I was studying this, I thought, "Man, if my name were Anthony Schmizzy, <laughs> how things would have been different for me." Yeah. First off, Might I would have been somebody. I would have been riding the Tony Schmizzy train for a long time. I would have went Tony Schmizzy. Yo, my name's Tony Schmizzy. And by the time I got to high school and people realized how cool I was, I would just be the Schmizzy. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, know, I'm Tony Schmizzy. I put too much thought into this, yeah. but the, here's put a little sauce on it. So these guys were staying at a different hotel. They were staying at a place called the Blue Water Resort. The friends of Peter later told police that they did not know Brittany prior to being at that club that night with her. And we're not even sure how Brittany knew Peter because Peter was 20 years old. Mm-hmm. He's He uh, was a quote unquote club pr- promoter. Right. He, that's what he called himself in social media posts from various Stating that he did that for various clubs in the Rochester area. Which, uh, think about this. Think about how much this doesn't make sense. You're a club promoter, and you're 20 years old. And I'm sure there's a lot of teenage clubs, but not that many because they don't make that much money. You need people drinking in bars. So your club promoters are normally above the age of 20. Right. And let's also be real about this though too some of these club promoters it's not a real job right mm-hmm. you know sometimes it's just a guy or girl that's that's a partier with some kind of social following who will then you know the club may not even pay this individual yeah peter's very um you know gtl jim tan laundry for those who don't know and um you know he's going to get his eyebrows waxed he's going to get his hairline tight but also throw in the faux hawk um, this guy's a very Jersey Shore. Yeah. And like I said, may not even be paid by these clubs that he's supposedly promoting. Sometimes they just let these individuals in for free and maybe feed them some booze throughout the night to keep them there. Right. But keep he's the party 20. going. He's 20. So they're feeding them some fruit punch. <laughs> uh, word is that during the day, Peter uh, ran or was somehow involved with a landscaping business. Now, Peter has said that he and Brittany were friends for about two years leading up to this point. In any event, Brittany definitely knew him beforehand. Right. It's possible that maybe he got her into Club Kryptonite, where the two of them were seen in the VIP area. Yeah, now let's be clear. I, I think when when they asked Peter if they were friends, I think he's saying yes, but loosely. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense, I think they're probably more acquaintances, but they're not in constant contact with one another. I think he's actually saying, "Hey, I'm I was friends with her out of respect for the fact that she's missing." I just okay. want to put out that's my gut feeling. Okay, well, I think this is probably a good time to discuss what exactly Brittany was doing there, and I, what I mean is why this crowd of people. You know, by all accounts. The girls she was traveling with, Alana and uh, Jennifer, they were older. We know that. And they were not close friends of Brittany's. Right. Brittany's best friend, uh, Casey and Tara, uh, were her high school best friends. And her boyfriend, John, none of these people went along on this Myrtle Beach trip. But you know how sometimes it works in high school. You kind of jump into another group for a little bit. Mm -hmm. That kind of happens throughout your four years. And in high school. Well, here's the thing I wonder about. Um, Alana and Jennifer had boyfriends who were on this trip with them. It's, it's, it seems a little strange to me that they stayed in separate, um, rooms or separate hotels. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing too, is though you have to wonder, is this just a situation where Brittany could not get her, her boyfriend, John to go with her. And then she's the odd man out. But we never have at any point John saying like, hey, I was best friends with uh, Peter or anybody. Well, not not Peter. I mean, uh, Alana and Jennifer's boyfriends. Oh, right, right. Um, which he may have known from school. And then so we have Brittany who lies. She's she sneaks away with her friends. Well, with people and couples that she reportedly did not know very well mm-hmm. who were in an older party crowd. Okay. 
Uh, so did Britney just want to hang out with older kids and maybe experience the party scene? Well, and this could have been happening a couple of weeks prior to, because with all the stuff going on with her family, she might've been, you know, so you, you see that sometimes <laughs> I remember a lot of high school parties where somebody uh, drank too much. They normally wouldn't drink that much, but they just broke up with their boyfriend or their girlfriend or their parents are going to get a divorce. So they were you know, drinking a little bit extra at the party. So mm. maybe that's what she's doing. Well, there are some theories out there that Brittany wanted to potentially boost some kind of possible modeling career. Uh, this being one of her ambitions mm -hmm. and perhaps she she's five foot tall. Okay. Well, I'm just saying that that cuts down a lot of the jobs that you can have as a as a oh, no, I agree with that. But, the, you know, there are still people that play high school basketball that are never going to play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of her ambitions. And the way this theory goes is that perhaps that she felt that she would have a chance on this trip to make some kind of impression on someone. And I, and I bring that up because her mother backs this thought up. Her mother believes this theory somewhat and thinks that it's possible that Brittany was even promised by someone that there was an opportunity for her in Myrtle Beach. Well, and it could have been, I mean, who knows where it came from. It could have just came from the internet, you know, Craigslist. Hey, sign up to be a model. Um, you know, it's actually, you know, doing porno behind the McDonald's. But there, there is a possibility, and I don't want to make fun of Peter too much. Like I said, normally club promoters are 21 at least, so they can get into the club. But, um... I was actually a f friends with a guy that was, I think, 19 and started being a club promoter in Athens, Ohio, and was actually really successful and had a lot of connections. So it's possible that, that Peter was the connection. You know, here's an acquaintance I have. I went to a couple parties that he mm -hmm. threw, and he knows some people mm -hmm. that I could get into. And it not, might not be like, you know, a lot of these club promoters, they need very pretty girls to take pictures of to Photoshop into these, you know, flyers and stuff. So it could have been something as simple as that, but that's it, intriguing. Be and I tell you why, because I could see a 17 year old girl or guy looking up to this 20 year old guy or girl, you know, a 17 year old looking up to a 20 year old and this person who is a quote unquote, a club promoter right. might, handled, might appear to her to have connections or to know people, you know what I mean? To be connected to, uh, higher ups or at least uh, at some degree well he handles himself a little bit i think i mean not every action but you know there's a couple times where you see him and just the way he dresses and it's like he's you know he's crossing his t's and dotting his eyes well this leads me to another theory and this theory is that Brittany had a crush on peter you know, we know that they knew, according to Peter's own words, mm -hmm. they knew each other for about two years up to this point, up to this Myrtle Beach trip, and that maybe she had some kind of crush on Peter and knew that he would be in Myrtle Beach and therefore went along with people that she wasn't that close to. But what about Greco? Kind of tagged along. She just forgot about Greco back home? This this is just a theory. Mm -hmm. There's no there's well, no evidence to point to this, but we're trying to figure out why she would go with people that she doesn't really know. There's by all accounts, mm -hmm. by all of her friends, by the people that she went to school with, people after she went missing would later say, "Look, she's not like super tight with these people. We didn't even know she hung out with these people." Right. Well, Peter was you know, fresh to death. So I mean, she could have had a crush on him. He's a, he, he was a handsome guy. I think that, you know, we should point out all of these things are, they're just speculation. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, we don't know at all what motivated Brittany to go along on this trip. It could just be something as simple as it sounded like fun. Right. Um, but it is worth noting that she was not good friends with her travel companions, despite several pictures that the group posted of them partying together on that trip. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. 
But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that. All right. Cheers, mates. Cheers. Cheers to all the fathers out there. I know we're a little late, but uh, happy Father's Day. Hope everybody had a great, safe, wonderful weekend. Now, back to our case, Captain. On the second day of the trip, we are now on Friday, and this is April 24th. Now, in all honesty, Captain, I do not know much about what happened that day. But what I do know, and this is from Brittany's conversations with her boyfriend, I know that Brittany had been having fun at first on the trip, but now by this Friday, it appears that she is not getting along very well with the girls that she had traveled down to Myrtle beach with John Greco, her boyfriend later says that the crowd she was hanging with was pretty into drugs in his opinion. And that was not Brittany's thing. We know that she was spending time, um, some time alone. And at one point on Friday night, she was walking along the main strip of ocean Boulevard, downtown Myrtle beach by herself. Now I'm looking back at my life captain, and I'm trying to recall a time of having gone on a vacation with a group of friends and not having a great time and deciding to just kind of go off by myself. And I, nothing really jumped out at me. It, 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 it seems you know, cause I was trying to figure out, is this either a normal behavior for her or B normal behavior, given the situation, how most people would react. Um, and we can't say, like I said, I don't know that I know enough to say exactly what was going on that day, but from what I've been told from talking with friends of mine is that this seems to be an unusual behavior for a girl, for a 17 year old girl. I've been told that you know, especially on these types of trips, spring break, tri- you know, trips, people would, girls would travel in packs. Um, I've yeah, even been I told could... that it was like an unwritten rule that, that a girl that age shouldn't just go off by herself, uh, away from her group that she's traveling with. Right. And most friends are, you know, if you're going down to the local corner store or something, oh, that's not that far. But if you're going to, I'm just going to walk this trip. Somebody's going to go with you. But the, you know, key word there is when you're traveling with friends friends Mm -hmm. and these were more acquaintances so i think probably what happened was something happened where Brittany kind of felt distant from the group Mm -hmm. she felt like the outsider and i think maybe it was her way of just you know catching some cut you know let me catch my breath and then get back into this situation yeah and actually i could only think of one time where friend and i got into some kind of disagreement on a trip to the point where we didn't want to be around each other. Mm-hmm. We had we had walked to some kind of pool hall, hung out there all night long, and I don't remember what we got into it about, but but this is the difference between traveling with friends and traveling with acquaintances. He and I get into this disagreement, and on the walk home, this was our separation. I walked on one side of the street, he walked on the other <laughs> side of the street. So that was that tough, but tough we guys. but we were tight. You know, mm-hmm. we wouldn't go we wouldn't be in a in a different state 
off by ourselves walking around and just one of us go elsewhere. And I'm talking about teenagers, you know, back when I was a teenager. And I think you bring up a good point here. This might be further confirmation that the people she's traveling with, she's not tight with these people. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't, she feels so much of a disconnect with them that if they're treating her unfairly or if she doesn't feel like she's fitting in or having a good time, she's okay with going out and walking around on her own. It also shows a bit of her uh, naivete right. to be out walking around in a place like Myrtle Beach. That Look, this place has like 30,000 people that lived there year round at the time, roughly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a huge population, but you and I went to Panama City uh, or Panama Beach together let's for not, not for spring that. break one time. But but what I mean is it's population wise in the, the tourism there is mm -hmm. a similar situation to when you and I went there, it, it felt like there was like over a hundred thousand people there and, and not that many people lived there. But for that week, it was crawling with people. Well, that's what makes this so dangerous because if you only have a population of 30,000 in this small community, and then you have an influx of, let's say just even 70,000, right? Or that's pro huge. Probably even more. So now what kind of riffraff is coming? You don't know. And, but to play devil's advocate, I actually had a really good friend of mine that went on a spring break trip with one of his really good buddies mm -hmm. and they got in an argument and the dude left him there. Like the dude like went got, home, got in his car and took off. Wait, and, guy, wait, guy was left there with no transport. Like the transportation he arrived in was no longer available when it came time to go home. Right. And we're talking like best friends. So it, it is possible. Not no mo. <laughs> uh, yeah. Not no mo. Hurt um, my feelings. <laughs> but I think. <laughs> But I think I, I really think it was, you know, gr you know, especially anybody that's younger, like it happens with guys, it happens with groups of girls where you start kind of picking on somebody. And I could see that maybe they would pick on her because she was younger and she felt alienated. So she was like, hey, I'm just going to spend a little time by myself like, and maybe these girls will come around. And then on the flip side of that, it almost makes you wonder why did these girls want her on the trip to begin with? Right. I yeah. mean, we, we sit here speculating how much Brittany was close with these people. Why, why, why do they just want some younger tag along? Yeah. But is it possible that they just said, it, you know, in passing, Hey, yeah, come, come with us. And then it stuck. And then they're like, Oh shit. She's <laughs> coming with us. Well, and I think, I think to add to maybe the level of the situation to help everybody understand the level of the possibility of this situation of not getting along with the other girls or not the group not gelling uh, is Don Drexel, Brittany's mother, who said that Brittany did not walk places, period. Mm -hmm. Like even in her hometown, she did not walk anywhere that Don would have to drive her everywhere that she went, even to sh for short trips, like to her friend's house who just lived down the street. Mm -hmm. So all of this walking from place to place alone that we're starting to see at the, st you know, Friday evening, Friday night is completely out of character for Brittany. Any of those towns like Myrtle Beach or like Panama, there's a strip. Everybody kind of hangs out on the strip, whether they're driving or walking. That's kind of a party in itself. You got the party on the beach, party in the hotel rooms, but you got the party on the strip. So I don't know. So she's walking alone on this Friday evening. Walking. What? You said, I think you said walking. Yeah. Oh, Walking. <laughs> she's walking alone so on this drunk, Friday walking. evening uh, and she's getting harassed and cat called um, by some guys along the route that she's making her way. Mm -hmm. Apparently this made her feel uncomfortable enough that she asked a quote unquote, nice looking young man to walk with her. This is according to him. This is a story that we will hear from him later. Now, we know that she and this guy who was also on spring break visiting from a, from the Midwest spent some time together in one of their hotel rooms. He took a cell phone video of her in which she can be seen sitting on the bed wearing a yellow shirt. She's on her phone talking and smiling. Now the video is timestamped 10 36 PM on April 24th, 2009. The young man who took the video brought it to law enforcement once he discovered that Brittany had gone missing. Its existence was not disclosed publicly until about a year later, but the guy has apparently been cleared by police of any involvement in what could have happened to 
Brittany. Well, good good for him for coming forward and sharing this information with the law enforcement. On Saturday, April 25th, we know from the police report that Brittany met Peter and his four friends on the beach near the Blue Water Resort. Now, keep in mind, this is where those guys were staying. Mm -hmm. This is between 11 a.m. and noon on that Saturday. And she walked by herself to this gathering. Uh, I'm assuming so because she was there by herself. Mm -hmm. Um, We know that Brittany was not enjoying the company of the girls that she was staying with. So, but at the same time, Peter could have picked her up. Mean, mean little bitches. Because those guys did have a vehicle. Right. So this could have been an, an arranged hangout and he could have picked her up or one of the guys could have picked her up using their vehicle. Yeah, but it could have been as simple as you're hanging out on the beach. You get a text. Hey, what are you guys doing? We're hanging out on the beach. Hey, I'll come down. And you go, okay. <laughs> you know, like you're not going to get up from the beach to go pick her up. You know, there was a, there is a rumor out there too, that Brittany, um, not only was she not getting along with these other girls, but she may have been the target of pranks or bullying by the other girls. Uh, I found one story stating that she was sitting or lying on a Murphy bed mm-hmm. that was, uh, I guess that was her bed in the hotel room that they were sharing. And one of the girls pushed the button to stow the bed. So, it, you know, like went up on Brittany, almost smashing her against the wall. Yeah. Um, so like I said, mean little bitches, we know that she knows Peter and now she has met Peter's friends. And so it kind of makes sense if this is what's going on, that she would seek out different companions to hang out with during the course of the remainder of this trip. Now she met Peter and the guys at the beach that note right there in my notes would lead me to believe that she made her own way there. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's believed that Brittany at some point that day must've got a ride from Peter, perhaps back to the hotel though, which is uh, 1.4 miles away down ocean Boulevard strip. Well, like I said, you, you'd have to visit one of these places to understand what the strip is. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but when we're in Panama, I think that was your um, senior year and my junior year, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was your junior year, my sophomore year, who knows. But but I just remember the strip being so congested that to drive 1.4 miles, you might as well just walk. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, so, it, w- it would take like 45, 1.4 miles might take you 45 minutes an hour. Right, so maybe one of the guys walked her back or or maybe they were walking to get something to eat and they just, you know, she followed along until she got close enough to her hotel. I mean, 1.4 miles is not a long way to walk. Well, I say that I believe that she received a ride from Peter at some point because we know that she left her flip-flops in his car. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming going off of my notes that she met them there at the beach and maybe got a ride back to her her hotel. Right. So around 2 p.m. that afternoon, Brittany's mother, Dawn Drexel, called her about purchasing a pair of soccer cleats. The call was brief, but when Dawn asked Brittany what she was up to, Brittany said that she was at the beach. Now, because it was 80 degrees in Rochester, New York that day, Don assumed that she was talking about Charlotte Beach in Rochester. Right. Brittany didn't take the opportunity to tell her mother the truth, but here's the thing. I have to wonder here, Captain, with her volunteering that she was at the beach. Mm-hmm. Um, was it a slip? Well, I almost wonder if, if she's having that bad of a time that she's almost was, was getting close to telling her mother the truth. Right. I'm at the beach and, and when not prompted, when the mom just thought, oh, she means some local beach here, she's not prompted to go, you know, you almost expect your mom to go, what the hell are you talking about? You're at the beach. And that's when you're like, mm-hmm. uh, I didn't want to tell you, but you know, I'm here. I'm having a horrible time. I hate these people. <laughs> this, re- this really sounds like something that Ohio people would think. I actually think she probably just was like, eh, everybody's at the beach right now back home. So mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I think it was. But, but but again, she is having a bad time, so I could see the speculation there. Yeah, and Brittany, I guess, ended the phone call by saying, I love you and see you tomorrow. Okay, let me just do a rough recap, or we can do it together. So on Wednesday, they get in a car. She's with some people that are not technically her friends, but acquaintances. 
They go down to Myrtle Beach. They get there on that Thursday. They're hanging out with people. They're partying. They go to a club. And then on Friday, she's hanging out with roughly the same people. They're staying in a ho- She's staying in a hotel with a group of girls that she loosely knows. And then there's a group of guys that she loosely knows as well in a different hotel. And that kind of brings us to Saturday morning when she makes the phone call or the afternoon when she makes the phone call to her mother. Yeah, her mom called her about a pair of cleats, and that's when she says, I'm at the beach. Uh, on that Saturday night at 8.15 p.m., this is April 25th, street cameras show someone, and I want to be clear about that, show someone who is believed to be Brittany walking on Ocean Boulevard. We can't tell which direction she is heading, but we know that she left her hotel, she being, we know Brittany left her hotel at the Bar Harbor around 8 p.m., and that she arrived at the entrance to the Blue Water Resort a short time later. We so also that, so know... she's back to see the boys. Correct. We also know that it is a 1.4-mile walk, and Brittany did not have a car, so we can only assume that it is her that was spotted. We can assume that she walked to this hotel despite her not liking to walk places. Mm -hmm. The street cam shows her texting on her phone as she walks, which as we, we all know can mean that she's not really paying attention to her surroundings at time at this time. This area of the main strip is basically a road running between the large hotels and resorts all along ocean Boulevard. Police later confirmed that she had been, Brittany had been texting her boyfriend as well as Peter, whose hotel she was heading to. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, Blue Water Resort cameras caught Brittany entering the lobby at approximately 8.35 p.m. with her purse over her shoulder. Note, however, that the actual videos are are time-stamped. They they have a different time. Uh, There seems to be a common discrepancy between recorded times and you know, on the surveillance videos and the actual time, (laughs) almost every case we cover. Have you noticed that 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 happens if you're going to have time, right? But if you're going to have security cameras, just make sure that you set the the time, right? Okay. Just do that. Well, can I tell you why that happens at most of these places? Mm -hmm. Uh, for, and I know this from, from work history. This happens because a lot of times places will install security cameras and they will take certain security measures, but they will not have anyone that is in fact in charge Right. of security. You need, you need a point person. You need somebody you can go to and say, uh, why is this this way? Correct it. Mm-hmm. So obviously either this person, they had one and they did a shoddy job or they didn't have this person at all. So we do see Brittany walking into the blue water hotel, the resort there in any event, regardless of what the timestamp says, Myrtle beach PD believes that Brittany entered the blue water at around eight thirty five PM. So about 20 minutes after she passed the street cam. Yeah. Brittany enters to her right and goes to the sixth floor. This is where Peter and his friends are staying. The boys are in room six zero one. Now they said that that night they were watching the Boston Red Sox versus the New York Yankees game. So big time baseball game. The game started at 4 PM and it ended at 8 31 PM. They stated to Myrtle beach police that Brittany visited during the actual baseball game, although they would be proven wrong or to be at least slightly off on their timing, because we know from the camera footage, she did not arrive until after the game was over just minutes, Mm -hmm. just a few minutes after the game. So we can surmise that Brittany came to Peter's room to retrieve the flip-flops that she had left in his car. She is visible on camera leaving the blue water at 8.48 p.m., still with her purse. Yeah, so she's in their hotel room for maybe 10 minutes. Yeah, so why would Brittany walk that far to Peter's hotel, which would likely take probably 25 or 30 minutes only to stay for 10 minutes? Well, the answer is, according to Peter and his friends, this is cited in the police report, that Brittany and Jennifer, her hotel mate and supposed friend, had been having a disagreement over text about a pair of shorts that Brittany was wearing. The shorts 
actually belonged to Jennifer and she wanted them back. She wanted to wear them that night. So she needed Brittany to return and give her back her article of clothing. Yeah. This, this really makes me wonder because did Brittany take these without your permission or did you say that she could wear them and then you decided to be a Uber bitch and text her once she got down, you know, once she started walking to Peter's place, Hey, I changed my mind. I want my shorts back Well, because they're playing pranks on her. They're bullying her. This just seems like a, you know, some kind of ruse, you know, to get her back. Regardless, the, according to these friend, these young men, the group of young men, right. uh, Brittany had to leave and walk back to the Bar Harbor to return the shorts. There is quite a bit of debate as to why this group of guys at the Blue Water Resort allowed this teenage girl to leave their hotel and walk nearly a mile and a half, almost at 9 p.m. at night, Mm -hmm. all by herself. Peter says that it wasn't dark yet at that time, according to his memory, and he he claims he offered Brittany a ride, which she declined. Mm-hmm. according to what her mother believes of her daughter would seem out of character for her daughter, unless there was something going on that we're unaware of. Yeah. But here's what we do know. We do know we have proof that she walked to their hotel room or to meet them multiple times. We also have proof that Peter drove her back at some point. So we should not, not believe that Peter asked her, Hey, do you want me to drive you back? Mm-hmm. And we do know she left there. Fine. You right. know, she left there, uh, visibly with the items that she brought to the hotel, she's leaving there 10 minutes later Mm -hmm. in an interview with Dr. Phil Peter. Who's that? Uh, he's, he's a guy that claims to be a, um, doctor, doctor. (laughs) And he's a TV doctor. He's a TV. Yeah. Yeah. Just like you're a garage captain. Yeah. I don't need to, I don't need to put my head up his ass to find out he's not a doctor. In an interview with Dr. Phil, Peter, who, let's just to put it as simple as possible. He comes across as a total douche canoe in this, Mm. this interview. He says we differ on that, but well, that's my opinion. And Mm. I, and I'll tell you why, uh, he says, quote, this is a direct quote. I I wasn't in Myrtle beach to babysit. Yeah. Which seems, look, here's the thing. I'm not saying he's a douche canoe in the sense that I wonder if he's covering something up. He could be, he could be, Mm -hmm. What I mean is I think there's better ways to deliver your words when you're on national TV and you're discussing the disappearance and possible murder of a young girl. Yeah. I think the problem though is his emotions were way out of whack. He's still 20 years old. This happened weeks after she went missing and his, his emotions are just way out of control. I think this guy knows how to talk to people. I think he knows how to be slick if he wants to be. I don't think he could be uh, on this show because I think he was just so irritated about his name being thrown under the bus and and really everybody kind of pointed to, here's this guy and he's the number one suspect when there was no evidence of that at all. And I think that's where he comes across maybe a little douchey because he's upset, he's angry. Mm -hmm. And yet she's, in his defense, she's seen leaving. Mm-hmm. perfectly fine. He offered her a ride perfectly. According to him, he offers a ride. So, mm-hmm. so Brittany leaves the blue water at eight 48. When we see her in the video, she is still holding her purse. It is hard to tell whether she it's totally dark outside because the entrance area to this resort is illuminated by exterior lights. Well, and like I said, the, <laughs> this strip is lit up, man, not only with the street lights, but with the thousands of cars that are on the strip. As Brittany walked, presumably along ocean Boulevard in the direction of the bar Harbor, she was also texting her boyfriend Mm -hmm. in one of those texts. He said he has said she told him how she was so miserable. She had already packed up and she was ready to leave for home. He encouraged her. The boyfriend encouraged her to try to have a good time. She told him she was going to chill in the hotel and go to bed. I would have said, F off. (laughs) Hey, I know you had an awful time, but try to have a good time. F off, man. The last text from her was at 8.58 p.m. 
After this text, John wouldn't get another reply from Brittany. He continued to text her, but got no response. Mm -hmm. He even threatened via text that if she didn't answer him, he'd call her parents and tell them what was really going on. Yeah. Then, then, this, oh, this is two things. One, he is obviously concerned as her boyfriend, but this is also, um, you know, jealousy. Then police later confirmed Brittany had not been picked up by the street cam. So to be clear, she was not seen by the street camera that she would have passed, would have had passed by to return to her hotel. Did her hotel have uh, security footage? I don't believe so. Yeah. So, you know, just because we don't have her on the street cam does not mean that she didn't kind of avert the, the street cam. Right. But what it does mean is that it's possible that she did not make it back to that location. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, presumably if that was her on the street cam that was seen walking from her hotel to Peter's hotel, mm -hmm. which it seems incredibly likely because we know what time she would left her hotel, what time she arrived at Peter's hotel. We know about how long it would have taken her to make that route by and we, foot. Yeah, and we know what she was wearing. We also have her texting. We have her phone records from that time where she's seen texting. There's the person on camera seen texting and we know she was sending text at that time. Mm -hmm. So if she were to take the, the same route back to her hotel on foot, she didn't make it back to that same location of that street camera. So about an hour after John Greco after he's not receiving any, any word from Brittany mm -hmm. and he's already threatened to call her parents and still nothing. Now he calls Don Drexel to tell her that he couldn't get a hold of Brittany. And he was very concerned like many teens. Brittany was generally glued to her pink cell phone. Mm -hmm. We can only imagine how upset Don must have been to learn that her daughter had lied to her in a very, in a very big way for days. John says Don was initially very angry, but then became worried after the information set in. And I believe it's roughly like a 14 hour drive. So, I mean, this is a, you know, it's one thing you're, if your kid lied to you and, and they're an hour away or two hours away, but to be roughly about 14 hours away, that's, I mean, definitely as a parent, you, you can't correct the situation right now. Or within an hour of driving. Well, the two, Brittany's boyfriend and her mother, they're going to try to track her down. Mm -hmm. So her mom and John called Brittany's phone over and over and over again. Now, according to them, the phone would ring on their end, but no one ever answered. Mm -hmm. So her mother even tried calling both Alana and Jennifer that night, but she has said that neither of them answered her call even after she left voicemails for both of these girls. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple things here. You have to wonder about these girls at this point, right? Why, why wouldn't they answer? Bitches. Well, why wouldn't they answer or return the frantic late night calls from Brittany's mother? If they're, if they're sober and awake. Well, but he, right. Yeah. But even if they're drunk, they're on their phone texting, you get a random number from your hometown. You probably would check the message, you know, yeah, maybe you don't want to get Brittany in trouble, but, uh, you know, this is a frantic mother. You need to, you know, act responsible. According to Don Drexel, none of these girls has ever at any time reached out to Brittany's family in any way. Don did manage to make phone contact that night with Peter, mm -hmm. speaking with him more than once, but he said he didn't have any idea where Brittany was. And he had not seen or heard from her since she left his room this around 845. After being told by the Rochester police that they couldn't do anything more to help, Don decided to call this man. His name is John Hahn. Okay. He's a family friend who was stationed in North Carolina, which is about three, mi three hours away from where Brittany would have been. Right. She asked him to drive to Myrtle Beach and to look for her daughter. And if he can't find her, to please alert the local authorities. Dawn made arrangements to get to Myrtle Beach as soon as she can. 
But in the meantime, she's going to have her friend John looking for Brittany. Right. She was so sure that something she, okay. She wanted to get there because very quickly she is starting to think something has happened to her daughter, that her daughter's not just not picking up her phone or ignoring her mother or that the, the, the friends are ignoring the mother. Yeah. 30 minutes go by, maybe not so big of a deal. Once a couple of hours start going by, especially somebody that's connected to their phone as much as Brittany was. Now this, I mean, this is huge. This is a big red flag. John Hahn arrived and found that Brittany had not returned to her hotel. He then reported Brittany as missing. The missing persons incident report uh, filed with MBPD the next morning is dated April 26, 2009, and the timestamp is 1902, so 7.02 p.m., although John met the officers at the hotel in the early morning. Mm -hmm. According to this incident report, Han met with officers Cleary and Dam at the Bar Harbor Hotel where they attempted to make contact with the occupants of room 305. Officers found no one in the room, but they did find occupants' belongings in the room. Officer Cleary then made a telephone call to Alana Lippa. Remember, that's one of the friends using a phone number provided by John, Mm -hmm. which presumably he must have got from Don or from John Greco, more likely. Alana told the officers that she had not seen Brittany. Officers Cleary later telephoned the guys staying at the Blue Water Resort. This is Peter's room. According to the incident report, the four friends of Peter's reported to the officer that they had met Brittany on Friday night at Club Kryptonite, although... We believe that she was actually there on Thursday night instead. Right. So, and we know this because she was video videoed in a hotel room at 10 36 PM on Friday night. So Mm -hmm. it's not likely she was at both the hotel room, this other hotel room and the club at the same time. It's unclear whether the guys were just confused about the day or whether they were deliberately trying to hide something. Yeah, I think most likely just confused. I mean, you're out in the sun, you're drinking beers, you're an amateur, you're 20 years old, you're an amateur, so they're probably just confused. When they're speaking with these guys, this is also when the officers learn that Brittany had been at the Blue Water on Saturday night in the boys' room, but as we had said, only stayed for about 10 minutes, Mm -hmm. leaving after an argument with Jen uh, regarding the pair of shorts and then presumably returning to the Bar Harbor. Another thing that's unclear, Captain, is exactly whose pose- whose possessions were in the hotel room. Remember, the police, they, they're looking into hotel room 305 for the girls. Mm-hmm. The girls are not there. However, there are belongings in there. The, the girls that Brittany was staying with, Jen and Alana, they had either already relocated or were planning to relocate to the Boardwalk Motel. And this is room number 1435. We do know that Brittany's things were in room 305. All of her luggage, clothes, makeup, and her hair stuff was there. Brooks, explain to me why they're relocating Saturday night when they're possibly going to be leaving Sunday. I don't have an explanation for this. Yeah, that don't seem right. So as far as Brittany's concerned, only her purse and cell phone were missing. Mm Mm-hmm. The fact that Brittany had left behind her, this is according to her mother, her beloved flat iron kind of sealed it for her mother that something bad had happened to her daughter, stating that Brittany would never go anywhere without that flat iron. Mm-hmm. So as far as the family is concerned, Brittany had not, she had not run away or left on her own accord. What more question arises about this hotel room? You know, you had mentioned it. Their boyfriends were on the trip. And the boyfriends were all college age. Why wouldn't they stay with their boyfriends? Mm-hmm. You know, and why did they, they switch, like you said, hotels on that Saturday night? Was, was this planned or was this something that just happened? Mm-hmm. Was Brittany supposed to stay in that room by herself that night? Right. Because they had this argument and maybe they, maybe they just thought, hey, we're going to move. We can't stand this girl anymore. So even though they're the ones, you know, seems they're the ones being mean to her anyways. Mm -hmm. Well, one 
online site dedicated to Brittany has pulled incident and arrest reports from that weekend and reports that on Saturday night around the time Brittany disappeared, two of the guys in her party, this is the gentleman I had a, had trouble saying his name, this Uger Ozturk. Mm-hmm. And this other guy who's <laughs> got even more of a difficult name, uh, Viet Guyen. Mm-hmm. These two guys, they were arrested. For um, making out behind the McDonald's? That's not illegal. Um, One of these guys was Jen's boyfriend. Remember this Uger? Well, I guess it depends on how passionate it is. Okay, so they were driving Jen's brothers, uh, Phil. They Mm -hmm. were driving his 2004 Pontiac Grand Prix GT that night. Baller. They were pulled over for a noise ordinance. Mm Mm-hmm. The man was ticketed further for driving without a license. And the passenger was ticketed for littering. Repo- oh. Yeah. Reportedly, shit. Jennifer and Phil were called to come to the police station to pick up the car and post bail for the two guys. Mm-hmm. All of this is said to be around the time that Brittany disappeared. Although, you know, we can't confirm that because we don't know exactly what time Brittany disappeared right in addition to the girls that Brittany had been traveling with relocating hotels there was the the very strange fact that between 1 and 2 a.m uh saturday night well i guess really sunday morning peter and his four friends checked out of the blue water resort and they they left town yeah now what he states is that they were planning on leaving around five six in the morning because they had a 14 hour trip for them to go all the way back and to get back super late on a Sunday and then to be ready for work or whatever they had to do Monday morning was going to be difficult. Uh, So they decided, hey, we'll just leave at 2. We're going to get back you know, midday, Sunday, so then we can sleep, whatever, get everything ready for Monday. The the issue, I I don't have a problem with that because I think on our our trip, we uh, went to stay in Cincinnati and we were going to wake up the next morning to leave to go to Panama. Roughly the same time these guys said they were going to leave, five or six in the morning. We were going to leave very early in the morning. Right, and then we were at this party, and we were just being kind of dumb, and we're like, let's go now. Well, I think we were pumped up, and we could, you know, you couldn't sleep anyway, so you're like, well, it does me no good to just lay here. Right. You know? So so I kind of see their story. The thing I what's weird about it is that they went to a club. They were partying. This is what they claim. And so to take a 14-hour drive after you've been partying, I don't know if that's the smartest thing in the world. The other big... Wait, wait, wait. And the other red flag that I have there is he talked about if you left like at 10 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock in the morning with the strip being the way it is, you weren't going to get out of there. No, and that's reasonable. Right, but you leave at 2 a.m., the strip is still happening. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good thought. So... If if you left at five, maybe the strip's not happening. But you left at two, strip's happening, and so it's really strange to me that you have these four individuals, and then you have these girls, and they're both switching their plans roughly around the same time. So they also these guys left some of their clothes in the room, which is not a huge red flag to me. I've been on trips where I've probably partied a lot less than these guys were partying this week. Mm-hmm. And I've left things in, in the hotel room on accident to the point where I'm like halfway home and I'm cursing myself. You know, thongs. And um, stuff. But one thing that I wondered about was by leaving in the middle of the night, they actually, these guys forfeited their room deposit. Yeah. Which, wow. which seems a little strange for guys in their early 20s. Maybe they didn't know that was going to happen. That's true. Um, That's yeah. true. We don't know the time of the calls that Dawn made to Peter. We do know they happen where, you know, he tells her he didn't know where Brittany was. But since John alerted Dawn to Brittany being missing around 10 or 11, it would likely have been before 1 a.m. or right around that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Peter and his friends leaving Myrtle Beach so abruptly. Well, this makes me very suspicious because it could be roughly around the same time or just after receiving these calls from Dawn that spooked him right right that had he done something or his boys or all of them done something wrong something bad 
Now he's aware that other people are aware that, that something happened, that Brittany's missing. Mm-hmm. It didn't help that as soon as Peter got to Rochester and learned that Brittany had not been located, he lawyered up. And this lawyer told NBCnews.com that Brittany began hanging out with the guys after several disagreements with the friends that she was traveling with. He said that after Brittany left the hotel, Mm -hmm. the guys, Peter and the guys went to, as you stated, a nearby club. I think he might've called it a a college party, but it doesn't mean that it was not at a club, Uh, but but there's several eyewitnesses. Yes. Uh, Then the young men, they decided just to leave and get a head start on their long drive. Peter's lawyer went on to say that the car that the men had been traveling in has been searched by the time of this interview and that Peter was willing to submit DNA. Now you bring up something very interesting here because if all of this is true, then Peter was seen at this party or club. So therefore Roughly he, around the time that we think Brittany went missing, right? Therefore he would have an alibi at the, at, at least for the time that he was there at this party or at the club. Mm-hmm. Peter was initially named a person of interest by the Myrtle beach police. But by May 7th, 2009, he had been cleared of having any involvement. This was puzzling to Brittany's family, who believed that Peter not only was the last person to see Brittany, but they believe that he knew much more than he was willing to say. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Make sure you join us back here in the garage tomorrow for part two of the Brittany Drexel disappearance story. And also, check out our show, Off the Record. We just released episode eight on Stitcher Premium. Until tomorrow, everybody, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Angie's List You Know and Trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.